Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Arab Center, Washington, D.C., I would like to welcome you to this uh, timely uh, webinar dealing with the oil market, uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 uh, on the Arab world uh, economies. Uh, we are pleased to organize this uh, webinar in terms of our continuing coverage of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly in, in terms of our own uh, focus, uh, the Middle East, uh, the Arab world uh, in particular. We are uh, honored uh, to have with us today two experts whom I will introduce uh, in a minute uh, or two uh, to help us uh, decipher in practical terms how this uh, global uh, health uh, crisis has affected the economies uh, of, uh, of the region, both in terms of short term and, and also uh, long term, uh, the implications of the oil price war on Gulf economies, particularly the de developments of the past uh, 48 hours with regards to the crash uh, of, of oil prices in very historic and unprecedented uh, manner and the implications of that uh, for the region and internationally for the markets. And the recent uh, U.S. Uh, mediated uh, agreement with the so-called OPEC plus uh, and uh, discuss a little bit uh, the future uh, of OPEC in, in light of the details of, of that agreement, whether OPEC is still really uh, necessary uh, and, and uh, in what shape uh, it might uh, survive. Uh, our speakers today are um, Garbis Eradian and uh, he's the chief economist of uh, Middle East uh, for the Middle East and North Africa at the Institute for International Finance, the IIF, and uh, where he is in charge of uh, Lebanon, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and the GCC, most of the countries we would like uh, to discuss uh, today. And prior to his affiliation with the IIF, Dr. Iradian uh, served as senior economist and uh, resident rep at the International Monetary Fund, Fund, the IMF, here in D.C. And he is a widely respected expert on economic growth, particularly in transitional economies uh, around the region and the world. He is widely published on the topics of uh, uh, MENA uh, economies, uh, oil markets, uh, OPEC production, and so on. Uh, our next uh, uh, guest today is our friend Basma uh, Mumani, uh, Assistant Vice President of International Relations and Professor of uh, Political Science at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Ontario uh, Canada, our good neighbors to the north. And uh, Basma is a senior fellow at the uh, Center for International Governance and uh, innovation and serves on the board of uh, directors of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, Foundation. She has authored and edited many uh, books and publications, articles on international politics, Middle East affairs, uh, and the uh, global uh, economy. Each one of our speakers uh, would speak for 12 uh, to 15 minutes. Uh, then we will engage in a conversation, short conversation for a couple of minutes just to in initiate our Q&A uh, session, and then we will give you the opportunity, uh, our audience uh, online, to uh, uh, ask your uh, questions. Let me, by way of announce announcement, just say that, uh, uh, be brief uh, in your questions, preferably a question rather than a comment. Address it to a specific uh, speaker, if you don't mind. Uh, indicate your name and your affiliation. And if you are using Zoom uh, platform to join us today, uh, uh, use the Q&A feature uh, uh, of the portal at the bottom of the page. And if you are connected uh, through the ACW website, uh, use our email. Send your questions to events at arabcenterdc.org. Events at arabcenterdc, one word, dot uh, org. Uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, proceed with the uh, with the program. Uh, and uh, the uh, questions that we have uh, raised uh, with the speakers, as I said earlier, uh, deal with uh, uh, the uh, first of all the uh, the nature of the crisis itself. So uh, feel free to share uh, with us your understanding or your assessment. Uh, 
of the global uh, context uh, of, of uh, uh, the pandemic, and then narrow down uh, that uh, to uh, the Arab world uh, specific, specifically. Uh, and then we'll go into a, a question and answer session. Um, Dr. Eradian, please. Thank you, Khalil. Um, let me first start uh, with the oil market because this is crucial for most of the countries in the region. Uh, this is, uh, for the region as a whole, this is a twin shock. First, uh, the global recession. Most countries around the world will, uh, uh, will contract uh, this year, uh, ranging from minus three to minus six. In Europe, for example, minus six or so. In the United States, around uh, minus four. So it's a big shock, unprecedented. It hasn't been like that for uh, since the Second World War. So the main thing on the oil market is the demand shock. In 2015 and 2016, it was mainly supply shock. However, now it's dominated by the demand shock where global uh, recession, deep uh, recession, uh, led to sharp decline in demand for oil. Just in the past two months, uh, global demand for oil plunged by about 25%. Now, uh, OPEC plus alliance, which is led by Saudi Arabia and Russia, they met uh, uh, one week ago, and on April 12th, uh, they agreed to cut crude oil production by 9.7 million barrels a day. To put it in perspective, this is about 10% uh, of global supply. However, this agreement will be effective in May of this year. So still you have uh, excess supply in the market, and we've seen it in uh, oil prices dropping uh, more than 60, 70%. And yesterday, the WTI, uh, which is the bench bank, uh, benchmark for United States, went to negative territory. Uh, it was a glitch because there is enough supply of oil in United States and storage capacity reached its limits. So um, oil companies are trying to give it free However, uh, today I checked the future market. It shows that uh, WTI is hovering around $15 per barrel and uh, brand crude, which is the global uh, benchmark, is uh, slightly over $20 per barrel. Uh, I expect that oil prices for the second quarter of this year to bottom around $30 and then in the second half of this year, uh, it could pick up depending on uh, partial recovery of the global economy. It all depends on uh, COVID-19. There is much uncertainty how long it will last, uh, and that will affect the global demand for oil. Uh, but overall, beyond the short term, future prices show that prices of oil will remain low. Uh, future pr uh, prices now showing that oil averaging, averaging uh, about $40 per barrel for Brent for this year and uh, recovering gradually to around $50 by 2024. So imagine uh, that the Middle East oil exporter are living in an era of prolonged low oil prices, and this poses major challenges. Uh, let me say a few words on the MENA oil exporters, which includes the six GCC countries, Algeria uh, and Iraq. Uh, so we said Arab world, so Iran is not included here. Now, there is variation among these countries how they will cope with the plunge in oil prices. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and Kuwait could cope with low oil prices for at least two, three years. The reason is that public debt to GDP ratio is modest. For example, in Saudi Arabia is around 25% last year. It could rise to 35% this year. And they have large 
financial buffers in the form of uh, uh, official reserve and sovereign wealth funds. For example, Kuwait sovereign wealth fund is about five times the size of the economy. So there is enough cushion and they can easily finance uh, the large fiscal and current account deficits. Incidentally, uh, in the past few weeks, uh, Qatar raised about 10 billion in the international market and uh, followed by Abu Dhabi also raised about seven, eight billion. Uh, Saudi Arabia also is raising. So there is no uh, constraint on uh, financing the deficit in the short term for the four uh, GCC oil exporters. The major risk is with uh, uh, Algeria, Iraq, Oman, and Bahrain. Oman and Bahrain's debt to GDP is quite high, and uh, they don't have enough uh, official reserves or sovereign wealth fund. Uh, this is why Oman and Bahrain decided to cut government spending because they don't have choice. They will face difficulty financing the large deficits. Uh, even Algeria also, they cut uh, current spending by 30%. So imagine in an environment of weak economic activity or contraction, you're cutting fiscal spending. In the past several decades, most of the growth in MENA oil exporters came from large public spending. So the private sector didn't play a major role. It's mainly public spending. It has reversed since 2015. And now you are in a situation of prolonged low oil prices. They cannot increase public spending. And it will take some time for the private sector to, uh, to be the main uh, sector for growth. And that needs diversification and experiences from many uh, oil exporters around the world shows that this is a long process. Uh, in a way, low oil prices could be more incentive for oil exporters in the region to reform. So I'm expecting that uh, MENA oil exporters uh, real GDP to contract by about 4%. As I said here, there is variation. Algeria could contract 6% percent, uh, Iraq by 7 percent, and part of the contraction, is, uh, the high contraction is due to uh, the cut in crude oil production. Uh, in GDP, you have all GDP and non-all GDP. Uh, so if you cut uh, production of oil, it will affect your overall growth. And uh, uh, although there has been stimulus packages, it's mainly in the form of providing liquidity to the banking system to lend to SMEs at uh, concessional terms. This could help a little bit. Uh, um, however, government spending has been reduced in most of these countries. Uh, fortunately, monetary policy uh, is easing. Uh, they cut interest rates uh, by 100 uh, basis points uh, in Egypt which is a net oil importer, uh, policy rates was reduced by 300 basis points. So overall, uh, the MENA oil exporters, their aggregated current account balance will shift from a surplus of around 100 billion in 2019 to something around 120 billion deficit. So imagine the scale. This is a shock of 220 billion for oil exporters in the region. Uh, the fiscal deficit will widen also uh, from around 3% uh, of GDP on aggregate in 2019 to more than 10% this year. Again, I said some countries in the region will be able to easily finance these deficits. Others are facing depletion of their official reserves, including uh, Iraq, Algeria, Bahrain, and to some extent, Oman. Oman has a small sovereign wealth fund, which could be tapped. Uh, there is much uncertainty uh, beyond the short term, uh, and that would depend on the evolution of oil prices. So uh, I expect that even after the crisis is over and global, uh, the global economy recovers slightly, uh, 
you will still have oil prices ranging between 40 to 50 dollars because whenever oil prices goes more than 50 dollars you will see shale production in the united states increasing so there will be supply shock uh, currently uh, uh, non-opec producers outside the, the opec plus alliance are expected also to reduce their production by about 40 million barrels a day mainly uh, in Canada, United States, Brazil, and Norway. This could help in the second half of this year. So let me say a few words on the uh, MENA oil importers, which includes Egypt, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, and Sudan. Uh, of course, these countries could benefit a little bit from lower oil prices because the import bill of oil will be much lower. However, uh, uh, a slowdown in the or contraction in the global economy and particularly in the Middle East will impact negatively on the MENA oil importers in the form of less tourism income, less remittances from the GCC, less investment. So I would say also Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, will uh, record uh, a contraction in the economy between minus two to minus four. Lebanon ha had its own problem before uh, this crisis where the economy could contract by about 15%. Um, Egypt, which was the best performer among the MENA countries, in the past three years, uh, growth was around 5%. They accumulated enough official reserves because there has been a major adjustment in the economy uh, in the form of uh, floating exchange rate, unification of the parallel and the official rate um, uh, due to the IMF program, which started towards end of 2016, uh, is in a better situation to cope with the current crisis. Uh, they might register a small growth for this year, and that's mainly because uh, 2020 is, is the fiscal year which starts from July 2019 and ends in June 2020. So the first half of the year was a growth rate of 5%, and the second half could be contraction about 2 or 3%. So, so nonetheless, Egypt is facing challenges. Uh, uh, foreign holdings of domestic treasury bills uh, were sold in the amount of uh, 10 billion. And uh, Egypt might face uh, difficulty financing its large uh, current account and fiscal deficit, although they have enough official reserves. So I wouldn't exclude the possibility beyond the short term that Egypt uh, approaches IMF for another program. Uh, recently, uh, Morocco uh, started tapping the precautionary uh, fund arrangement. Uh, Tunisia and uh, Jordan, they already have an IMF program. They are tapping also the emergency uh, uh, fund from the IMF. So overall, I think in the short term, they can cope well. However, most of these countries, with the exception of Egypt, they already experienced weak growth, uh, around 1% for the past three, four years, uh, including Jordan, Tunisia, and to some extent, Morocco. So unemployment rate is very high. In Jordan, is around 18%. In Tunisia, 16%. Uh, in Egypt, it came down from high level. Now it's about uh, 10 percent. Uh, so there are uh, major challenges uh, for these countries. Even if we mention from among oil exporters in Saudi Arabia, national unemployment rate was 12 percent last year. So unemployment rate could increase this year to around 13 percent or more. Um, if the economy contracts, the non-oil economy contracts by about 4%. Uh, so that's a major challenge for Saudi Arabia. Uh, UAE, Kuwait, and Qatar, they have a smaller uh, national uh, population. They can easily take care of them, uh, given their large uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund. So I'll stop here and uh, welcome any questions.
Uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for your comprehensive uh, presentation. A lot of uh, facts there to deal with, and I'm sure uh, it will generate uh, a lot of uh, questions over some of these issues uh, that you explained uh, rather well, but I'm sure uh, that there will be uh, some uh, inquiries uh, from uh, our audience. Um, uh, Dr. Momani, Fadali, your, your turn. <laughs> So um, thank you uh, to the Arab Center uh, for including me in this conversation. Um, I'm probably even more pessimistic than my colleague, uh, which is uh, saying a lot because as you heard, a very pessimistic sort of scenario uh, forecasting of where we're going. I think I'm gonna start sort of globally and then kind of uh, zoom into the region. Um, the big challenge I think we have also is global liquidity uh, is not where it should be. And I think the IMF has been uh, very confident, I think actually very optimistic in its forecasting and the numbers that you heard from my colleague very much follow the IMF's assessment. I think it's actually much worse. Uh, we have never been in a situation where half of the IMF membership, which is in fact what is going today, happening today, 90 countries have approached the IMF and we're just at the beginning of this. And frankly, I think the big uh, unknown is that frankly, the coronavirus has not hurt, you know, hit the developing world yet. Um, it has been, you know, isolated in Asia, it's in the West, but wait till it hits countries with massive populations, no state capacity, no public health infrastructure. So I'm extremely pessimistic. And if there's anything that we know about this virus, it's, uh, its veracity is quite strong. So uh, the challenge here is there's a shortage of global liquidity. I think it'll continue to be that way. Obviously, oil prices and entire commodity prices, it's not just oil. Uh, pretty much every commodity. So whether you're a, an exporter of potash to, um, you know, to any uh, mineral, we're all basically seeing a absolute decline of commodity prices. Now added to that, you know, one of the big engines of economic growth globally is China. Uh, China is what gobbles up most of that oil in terms of global demand. And it is simply not going to be in the positive for a very long time. Um, you know, certainly I think this is been said many a times before, we can't trust Chinese data, uh, but I think some of the uh, you know, global economists who are looking at everything from electricity uh, usage to the visuals of sort of nighttime uh, satellites in terms of lights going on and production, it's at a standstill. And I don't think that is going to change because the demand for Chinese production is in the West and the West is not consuming. So there's a Triple, there's a trickle effect, uh, trickle down effect here in terms of how negative this is for everybody. But that is a big challenge. Of course, many of the Middle East countries had previously depended on whether it's multilateral organizations like the IMF or even official development assistance, uh, the West, uh, primarily Europe, the United States to a lesser extent, um, and all the official development assistance that used to come from the West is not just going to be dried up, but frankly, there's no appetite in much of the West to really give uh, the Middle East any sort of financial resources. So you have this enormous shortage of capital that I think we're going to see eventually come uh, down to hit all of these countries. And as uh, my colleague said earlier, these are countries that don't have a lot of fiscal space. Now, uh, a lot of the oil exporting Gulf countries do, but I'll go into some of the challenges I think they're going to face here as well. So uh, some countries do have reserves, um, and that is an important defense against uh, potential shocks, uh, but those are also slowly going to dry up, and much of the forecasts uh, of their budgets have been based on assumptions of $75 a barrel, which we know is not going to happen. I'm not optimistic about the June for, you know, futures, uh, because once we get to June, I think we might see again uh, more of that uh, uh, negative selling that we saw, which was basically, please come take it off our hands and we'll give you uh, money, which is where we're, I think, going to be even in June, because this is not going to pick up. The global economy is not going to pick up in a month's time. This all points to another problem, which is about economic scarring, which is how much of this you know, economic pain is, is semi-permanent. Uh, this is something that I think is so uh, undeniably new to all of us. We're all dealing with this big question mark, but that is the real essence of the issue. Do we think that this is just a, per, you know, a temporary fix that once uh, the global economy starts re, you know, refiring its engine? Is it just about rebooting? I don't think so. I think we're going to see enormous structuring, restructuring um, in every sector. Um, you know, we're seeing it already looking at small businesses that are going to uh, collapse. So we're going to see a mergers of oil companies. We're going to see a mergers of, uh, you know, uh, 
um, every sector, retail, service, it, it's all going to be affected. So the ripple effects of that is not good uh, on anybody. So, I mean, that's the big picture that I think keeps me worried at night. Now, as far as the Middle East and, and including the Gulf, of course, the decrease in oil prices where many countries are dependent on oil exports uh, in the Gulf in particular is going to be problematic if we continue at some of these rates. Now, if we see, and it's all about the, the, the frankly, what the international sale price of oil is. You know, in a country like Iraq, uh, the cost of production is in some places as low as $5 a barrel. Uh, in parts of Saudi Arabia, it's maybe 10 to 15. Um, if you get to a point where we continue to see, not just negative, but those low numbers continue, it'll be frankly not worth taking out of the ground. That means you don't have revenue. Uh, now, of course, there is a bit of an inertia in the market. It's not that uh, it's going straight to consumer overnight, but you can just see the fallout ripple uh, throughout the markets for a very long time. The other thing, of course, is uh, some countries are slightly diversified and some of the Gulf countries have tried to, le to lean on tourism, airline, all of that is at a standstill. Um, there's going to be no big sporting events. Uh, again, the Gulf countries, some of them have been thinking about uh, attracting big sporting events as a way to re generate revenue. All of that is going to be dried up. People are canceling events well into the fall. So that's going to be a problem. And also back to the cultural and psychological aspect, how many people feel comfortable getting on a plane in the next year without a vaccine? So we're looking at a very long-term situation. And by long-term, I mean a year to two years. Uh, that is not a short-term fix. Um, the other thing I think we have to think about is, of course, we're all uh, understanding how workers' remittances feature into the balance sheet of every country in the Middle East. No country is affected. I mean, just to give you a stat that keeps me up at night, you know, 1.5 million Egyptians are in Saudi Arabia. Uh, those are the most vulnerable of vulnerables who are now basically without wage. Uh, many of them are indeed day laborers. And that's another challenge. Uh, we have, you know, with all due respect to the statistics that come out of uh, the region, they often undercount the informal economy. They don't count in um, who is it that is dependent on day wages. Uh, some estimates in Egypt are, you know, 40 to 50% are day laborers. What does that mean? That means uh, when this gets to a critical point, which we're gonna get there probably in a month's time in places like Egypt, that means, are they going to go out to get food for the day or are they gonna stay inside and quarantine? I think we all know what the options are. You add to that the slums, uh, the squalor of 10 people to a room, and those are the ripe conditions for the coronavirus to go maddening uh, throughout a society. Um, intergenerational uh, family structures where grandma lives at home. I mean, you just put the scenario building and you know, the West we've been looking at uh, devastation, I can say in Canada in particular, how old age homes have been devastated. Well, frankly, that's when most of these, uh, you know, senior citizens are in, um, in, in isolated facilities. Uh, what happens when they're in your home? I mean, you just have to start to see how this ripples uh, into uh, the, the family structure in Middle East societies, and it's devastating. So I'm very pessimistic about how this is going to unravel um, socially, politically, and economically throughout there, uh, throughout the region. Now, now going to sort of the economic situation of many Middle East countries, you know, they not only have, uh, in many cases, uh, most of them don't have enormous amount of reserves, some do, but they're also very low, shallow tax bases. So other than sort of VATs, uh, value added taxes, which is basically a sales tax, um, they don't really have a lot of, uh, you know, they don't depend on income tax. And so if there's no consumption, which we're at a standstill right now, no consumption, they're not getting a tax base. So their envelope, their fiscal envelope is shrinking by the day. There's no social safety net. Uh, public health infrastructure is poor to say the least. It's certainly very inequitable in that uh, the rich have access to public health care and in some cases, uh, very good public health care, uh, but the masses do not. And so what's gonna happen when you have, again, that ripe condition of this virus overtaking many of these countries? I'm extremely pessimistic as you can see. Now, guest workers in the Gulf, we don't talk about them enough. This is, again, another uh, segment of society where it's very ripe. Uh, they tend to have lower baseline health. They tend to be uh, not healthy in the first place. Um, add to that, uh, they're trapped in no man's land in the sense that they're not working. Uh, they're stuck in their quarters. There's been lots of uh, Amnesty International and human rights reports on the, the conditions that they live in. Many people to, a, to one room. Uh, once the virus hits those places. Now, 
they are many in many cases in the Gulf countries. Uh, those guest workers um, that are in the construction industry and other places are going to be, again, right conditions for this virus to have an outbreak. So that's going to be very difficult for Gulf countries to manage. Added to that, unfortunately, there is systemic racism and discrimination to those communities. And so are they going to be quick to respond or are they going to securitize the problem, which is most likely the case in many places. So that's an also another challenge going on. In terms of uh, the one thing that only keeps me somewhat optimistic in the Middle East is it has a young population. So maybe uh, in some cases, the death rate may not be as bad, but it's that intergenerational family structure that I think we have to keep in mind. Other sectors that I would keep an eye on, and as, a, as a, I put on my administ senior administration hat here as, as, as a, a senior vice president at the university, is universities in the Gulf um, are you know, also an important source of not just revenue, but an important uh, sector of, of the society and uh, an economy. Um, they are going to be hit very badly. Now, they are mostly subsidized by Gulf countries, uh, but increasingly all of us are faced with the huge challenge that our university campuses may be empty. Uh, those are also places where right conditions for spread. Um, that is not good for the Gulf countries that have spent more than a decade trying to attract all of these universities to set up shop. It's going to be very problematic, I think, coming forward. Of course, uh, places like uh, UAE ports, um, it certainly depends on the entire port infrastructure in places like uh, the UAE, to a lesser extent, some of the other countries are all going to see an enormous standstill, similarly because it is about moving goods and services, mostly goods, I should say, uh, between uh, um, you know, Asia, China, and other parts of the Middle East, um, that's going to uh, come to a standstill. Um, big signature events, uh, the Qatar World Cup, I was there recently, very sad to see. Those things may not happen. Uh, the OEE's World Fair may not happen. Uh, what is that going to do? Uh, that is a very sad situation, but it is unfortunately a realistic one if we think about it. Now, the other point here, and I'm going to wrap up, is that, of course, for many of these countries, these oil exporting countries, they're pegged to the U.S. dollars. So they can't print money, and they're very much uh, you know, held hostage by the U.S. Federal Reserve. And we know how that is very much politicized or trying to be politicized by the Trump administration. And uh, there's going to be, I think, challenges and conversations, maybe one good thing out of it about, you know, what do we do about the long-term health of, um, of, of oil being, you know, such a core part of, of uh, the uh, Gulf uh, economies when it is basically being um, held hostage to uh, the monetary policy of the United States big question. I remember working on that 10 years ago. I think it's going to come back as a conversation. There's lots of people talking about post oil. Is this a time to move away from oil? Um, I love my environmentalist friends who keep thinking this is going to be great for renewables. Uh, I don't think so, um, because we know that renewables and uh, other, uh, you know, um, unconventional sources of, of energy tend to do really well when oil prices are high. So that's not good news for moving away from oil, but it does mean um, that I think uh, you know, countries are gonna have in interesting conversations yet again about diversification. And, and that is gonna be an important part of thinking about a post COVID recovery for much of these countries. One thing I would look for is, are we gonna see a renationalization? I mean, the Saudiization of the labor force, you know, the, all of these um, kinds of things we saw uh, from the last uh, global financial crisis uh, were really born out of that pressure on governments to, you know, get rid of expat labor, think about increasing the, the quotas of, uh, of nationals in the workforce. Will we have conversations like that again? I think that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, we don't, we haven't seen the, some of you might remember this. I, I would certainly remember being in Dubai when all of the cars of expats that were being leased were left in the airport and, and literally people left uh, are we going to start to see that happen? I mean, we need to prepare for those kinds of scenarios because it will get that bad. Uh, in terms of a stimulus, yes, some countries have been uh, pouring money at this. And, and as my colleague pointed out, Qatar, you know, countries like uh, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, um, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi have been able to, to do that. Yes, Bahrain, uh, Oman and others are going to be more vulnerable. Um, but I think this is a time to be as pessimistic as one can get. Um, because I think it's, it's far worse than any global recession. And I think we're just being optimistic by not saying the word depression, but that's kind of where I think we're going. And I haven't even touched on the political aspect, 
but I'll leave that there because that will really depress you. And I think we want to try and keep this conversation a little light. Uh, thank you, uh, Basma, for your uh, brutal assessment, brutal but yet uh, very realistic and, and uh, straightforward in terms of the difficulties uh, that the region, the Arab region, is, uh, is facing. Uh, let me uh, engage both of you in just a couple quick uh, questions, and I would appreciate quick answers from you so we can open the floor uh, for uh, the Q&A session with, uh, with our uh, audience. First, going to Dr. Eradian. Uh, I got, uh, you know, the impression from your uh, presentation that you tend to agree generally with the assessment of the IMF that this crisis uh, is like no other, uh, with severe uncertainty about both uh, duration and uh, intensity, as you made it very clear in your presentation. But let me ask you to say a few more words about, uh, I mean, you, you did give us some, some good uh, meaty uh, assessment with regards to the intensity. How about the duration? What's what's your assessment? I know you, you did uh, touch on that one, but yeah. how, how do you see the duration of this crisis? Yeah, uh, duration of the crisis when it comes to the Middle East uh, could be different than the global economy. So even if the global economy recovers, assuming it recovers somewhat in the second half of the year, uh, of this year, uh, the duration of the crisis for the Middle East could be long time because I can't see oil prices recovering to significantly over $50. So as long as we are in an era of prolonged low oil prices, something below $50, the region will face uh, major challenges. Uh, particularly uh, oil exporters in the region. Now, uh, the duration, it all depends on the evolution of COVID-19, uh, whether there will be vaccines soon in six months, one year or two years. Uh, I heard yesterday that it could come more aggressively next winter. Uh, so for the Middle East is double shock low oil prices and also the COVID-19, which is uh, uh, leading to a deep recession uh, globally. Uh, so I don't see uh, in the short term uh, a light at the end of the tunnel for some of the Middle Eastern countries. Challenges are there even before this uh, crisis. Most countries in the region uh, were suffering from uh, low growth, high unemployment, increase in poverty, uh, particularly in oil importers in the region. Uh, and to some extent, Saudi Arabia, where 30 million population, uh, foreigners are 10 million, and national unemployment is very high. So that's a major challenge. Uh, let me uh, follow up uh, on, on uh, a statement that I saw recently made by Angel Gurria, Secretary General of the OECD, in, in, in which he said it was wishful thinking, quote unquote, to believe that these countries would bounce back uh, quickly. Yes or no? Do you agree with him? Of course, I agree with him. Uh, they will not. Uh, uh, which countries? You mean uh, Middle Eastern countries Middle or Arab uh, countries in general? Oh, no. They, they, I mean, it. They could recover from what? From a low base. So it's a partial recovery. I don't think uh, the recovery will be strong. I mean, the fundamentals, if you take in Morocco, are strong, relatively. Uh, Egypt uh, made uh, major progress in uh, reforming its economy. So Egypt also stands in a better situation than others. However, Jordan, Tunisia, Lebanon, Sudan, uh, it would be uh, very difficult. Okay. Uh, Basma, uh, you know, in a way, you, you spend a lot of time uh, career-wise looking at the IMF. You wrote the book uh, on the organization, so to speak. Uh, after hearing this, you know, with the possibility, uh, uh, as uh, Garvey mentioned, 5.9% uh, per economic contraction in the U.S. this year, 7.5%, uh, as some uh, experts have said, in, in most EU countries, even 52 in Japan. Uh, what can the IMF do in light of what you mentioned, that already 90 countries out of 189 have asked for help? 
I know the, the IMF has a large capacity to, in terms of lending, but can it meet the, the lending requirements of this massive demand right now? Uh, no, not if everybody comes at the same time. Uh, that's you know a classic challenge of, of everybody trying to to really um, you know uh, tap into IMF financing all at once. And the other thing too I would point out is that the IMF uh, could not get an agreement of its core members, and by that I mean the creditor countries, to increase its liquidity. Uh, the Trump administration does not want to put money into the IMF. Um, so there's going to be an enormous amount of resentment uh, or, or uh, let's say, uh, hesitation uh, amongst donor countries to put their money into the fund. That's a big challenge. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's like a credit unit. It depends on people putting money in. Governments don't want to put their money in. Um, so that's going to be a challenge. Of course, there's a bigger debate about uh, increasing the reserves of the IMF that's being held up. Um, not just by the Trump administration, but also Congress for a number of political reasons I won't have to go into. But at the end of the day, uh, the, I, the, the Americans have to agree to even let other countries put more money into the IMF. So it's really, we're at a standstill because international cooperation, um, thanks to the Trump administration, is also at its, you know, it's at its lowest. Um, that's going to be a big challenge. Now, you could say maybe some money might come from, I mean, the Chinese are trying to use public diplomacy at its all-time high in the sense of putting money into whether it's the Asian Development Bank, maybe put more money into the AIIB. Um, all of that is, uh, you know, well and good. Uh, but, you know, the Chinese also tend not to give direct loans. They want to build projects. And this is not about building projects. I mean, that might be a stimulus package later down the road. But for many Middle East countries, it's literally going to be a fiscal squeeze and that they're going to have no income, a low income, and very high expenses with the public health uh, nightmare that is becoming coming before them. Um, I think, you know, the way this virus works is it flourishes in a very dense environment. It flourishes in intergenerational homes. And that is exactly, you know, the situation we have in many Middle East urban areas. It is not going to be good when it hits the Middle East. Uh, when it hits the guest worker, you know, uh, rooms uh, and, and boarding type situation. And one other thing I want to point out in terms of a sector that I'm very interested in that I think is going to suffer, and there's been a lot of investment of time and energy on this, which is the entrepreneurial sector, the small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, you know, this is where we're going to see the first sense of collapse. So I'm not worried about the big, you know, uh, Middle East companies, the corporate giants, if you will. But think about all of the investment that's been made in the past decade, trying to get SMEs, particularly for young people, entrepreneurs. Um, wow, this is devastating for any entrepreneur. Uh, small businesses are going to be the first ones to feel this. Um, and I think that is a really sad indictment on, you know, the development trajectory for the region. Um, you know, if, you know, if you were, you know, this debate, you know, uh, many of us political economists have been on this debate about motivating the private sector and getting people off the public sector. But if anything, this crisis has taught us that, you know, it's really nice to have a public sector cushion. And some of us who have, you know, jobs in big public sector industries are the ones that are doing okay. It's the ones that are really in the private sector, SMEs, that are going to suffer the most uh, because they don't have the same cushion. And so that's a, a really sad um, you know, almost we're going to see a rewinding of some of the reforms that have been done throughout the region as a result. Uh, excellent. We're beginning to get some questions from our audience. Uh, so let me invite you both uh, to put your political hats on because it looks from the questions we have received, at least the first couple uh, tend to have a political flavor uh, to them more than what our discussion has been thus far. The first uh, question is, or set of questions actually, uh, came from uh, Kivanj Oshkan and uh, who's asking, do you agree uh, with the, that's addressed to both in a way, do you agree with the prediction that a kind of uh, political and military tension in the Middle East would find regional support uh, if it helps or because it might help to increase oil prices? Yeah, uh, I, I can answer this question. Sure. I think it's highly unlikely that uh, uh, Tensions in the Middle East will escalate uh, 
in the form, let's say, uh, if Iran attacks some of the uh, oil ships uh, in Strait of Hormuz, where more than 30% of the global uh, oil flows, uh, Iran doesn't, uh, Iran's exports of oil is very small due to the U.S. sanctions. So it's mainly a few hundred thousand barrels a day to China. I don't think that is plausible at this stage. Uh, most likely Iran will wait another six months till the next uh, U.S. presidential elections with the hope that uh, dem Democrats will win and the whole picture changes about uh, U.S. sanctions. Uh, now, if that happens, if there is an attack by Iran on some of the ships, you, of course you will see oil prices uh, increasing, but that will be very short, uh, short term. Because the dominant factor of the oil prices uh, now is the collapse in global demand. So uh, supply shock, a small supply shock will not alter uh, the picture. Uh, Basma, you have uh, uh, written um, over the past year or two uh, about uh, the economic situation in Lebanon, Iraq, there's the unrest in, in both countries. So the next question comes from Menatullah al Obaidi. Uh, how do you think this crisis will influence social unrest in the near future, particularly in these countries that uh, he mentioned, Lebanon uh, and, and Iraq? So I uh, am very pessimistic about this because, you know, we know there's a tendency in the Middle East to securitize these kinds of problems. And actually, I shouldn't even say it's the Middle East. I mean, I think there is a global, there's going to be a global um, appetite to use the security sector to manage this crisis. And what I mean by that is it, it is not inconceivable. I and mean, we've already seen in countries like Jordan, the military, I think for good, has been used to patrol people, to uh, pretty much make sure people don't go out into the street. But the question here, and this is a broader challenge that I think all societies are going to face, is how much power will we give to, uh, whether it's police, military, national guards, to basically enforce everything from lockdowns to be a part of the recovery. I could see already uh, signs of, frankly, in Egypt, uh, from anybody who's been watching, the military encroaching on, you know, its civilian space. Wait till uh, the, the the military starts in Egypt being uh, basically public health uh, administrators, because that's going to be coming. And so that that sort of securitization of this is going to happen, I think, across the board. The one challenge I would point out here is that also this is uh, comes at a time when there is enormous public distrust in government. And it doesn't help if the information that's coming out from government is mixed, if the information coming out from government is propaganda. We know, um, and there's lots of research on this, Amirta Sen and others, who look at these places where information is tightly controlled and censored, that this lack of trust really creates a ripe environment for conspiracy theories, a ripe environment for, for basically undermining uh, public health efforts, um, you know, surveillance increases in all of these countries, particularly the Gulf countries, they already have the mechan, you know, the mechan, uh, the, mechan uh, the mechanics, sorry, of, or the mechanisms for surveillance. They're already watching all of their citizens. There's going to be an enormous securitization of this space moving forward, whereby we're going to be expecting, uh, you know, our phones to be a part of contract tracing uh, for containing the virus. Uh, and, and you can't roll that back. Once governments have access to that kind of uh, technology, it's very difficult to get governments to give it back again. So it's not just, I mean, it really, even in liberal democracies, I think we're going to face this question. It's a broader problem. But in the Middle East, where there is already a very strong security sector, strong, you know, internal intelligence, suspicion vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the government and the public, I think we're going to see more of this kind of surveillance, particularly through technology, which becomes a problem politically. Now, I know we pointed to the first question was about Iraq and Lebanon, but I really want to lay that out because this is kind of the environment and the questions as a political scientist that I'm very interested in that's going to be moving forward. And the Middle East has not done well, generally, in terms of building trust between it and the citizens. The Arab Spring was all about a breakdown of trust. It doesn't do well in terms of uh, allowing the free flow of information, which makes all of these uh, uh, fake news and uh, you know conspiracy theories, and therefore 
uh, a disservice to public health efforts that much more uh, widespread. In the case of Iraq and Lebanon, they're already suffering uh, from an economic crisis. They're already suffering from a lack of trust in central authority. And of course, you can't forget that there is, of course, foreign intervention in all of these countries, uh, whereby everybody is trying to, you know, jostle for power. So it's not healthy, um, <laughs> is the short of it, even though yeah. I haven't responded to the precise question. Thank you very much. If I may uh, add a few points on the likely social unrest in Lebanon and Iraq. It's, uh, I would say, in a way, the lockdown and the restrictions on the movement help the local authorities uh, in the sense you don't see any demonstrations. But once this is gradually lifted, you will see mass protests, particularly in Lebanon, because nothing has changed. They didn't reform. Corruption is still very high. There are certain laws uh, uh, to fight corruption and uh, restore the stolen money, uh, which has to be discussed in the parliament and approved. It hasn't been done. Uh, Lebanese economy is contracting more than 15% this year. Poverty is more than 40%. Unemployment, more than 25%. So uh, most likely after a few months, if the uh, restrictions on movement is uh, lifted, you will see massive protests. Same thing with Iraq. Iraq is in the same situation. In fact, Lebanon and Iraq and Iran are the most highly corrupt countries in the world, according to the um, classification by World Bank and other institutions. So uh, it's most likely there, there will be massive uh, protests, even in Algeria. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me ask you, if you don't mind, Garbis, to shift gear a little bit to something you alluded to uh, in your opening remarks, which is the OPEC situation and, and particularly the price war uh, between Saudi Arabia and, and, and uh, Russia. Uh, this question came to us saying, did the Saudis misjudge oil demand when they started the oil price war? Is this indicative of, of the current decision-making process there? Uh, <laughs> Definitely. Who, who, who won this, uh, if you yeah. will? Yeah, you know, what, what happened in Saudi Arabia, as it happened uh, many times, this impulsive behavior by uh, Mohammed uh, bin Salman, he has advisors that they don't say what they think, they say things that he would like to hear. So they misassessed the situation. Uh, that uh, there will be a huge plunge in global demand for oil, and let's try uh, uh, to increase uh, crude oil production by Saudi Arabia so that we drive uh, shale producers in the United States out of, out of business and we increase the share of uh, Saudi uh, supply, in, uh, global supply. However, this uh, came as a surprise with the plunge in global demand for oil and all countries are suffering. So they didn't have choice but to agree with the Russians. In, in fact, Russia also realized the mistakes they have done uh, that uh, to mitigate the impact on oil prices, let's agree and cut crude oil production uh, within the OPEC plus alliance by about 10 million barrels a day. I mean, the situation would have been worse if uh, there wasn't an agreement at the OPEC plus level, uh, you would see oil prices even in the second half around $20. Now, it's likely that oil prices could recover slightly from around 20, 25 to something around 35 in the second half of this year. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Alain Kfouri. Uh, will the GCC governments be able to borrow their way uh, out of lower oil prices and with their decreasing financial buffers, how do they see the changing geopolitics and geoeconomics of the Arab region as the GCC could, could no longer, in a way, finance uh, the region and meet uh, the demand uh, for aid? Basma, you want to take a jab at that first? Yeah, sure. I mean, yes, it can. Uh, you know, I think uh, the Gulf uh, still will have uh, relatively good uh, ratings, uh, and so it will be able to go to the market, uh, whether it's, you know, it will go to the capital markets. It could also very much... Uh, 
um, continue to think about issuing domestic bonds of some sort. So it has capacity. I'm not too worried about it uh, financially in, in, in the, it definitely not in the long term and not so much in the short or medium term, but it's going to hurt. I mean, that's the point. The point is going to hurt and some countries is going to hurt more than others. Uh, still, oil exporting countries in the medium term are going to do relatively okay. Uh, but this is a crisis. And I think it's, you know, it's the countries like Oman, it's the countries like Bahrain, certainly uh, many of the oil importing countries throughout the Middle East that are going to really suffer financially from this. So yes, there's access to funding that they can get. Um, and, and frankly, they have enough reserves and sovereign wealth funds, as my colleague pointed out. So they're going to be able to tap into that. They're, they're not in a crisis situation, but managing this, getting out of it um, is going to be very difficult. All right, let me ask a, two or three questions with the remaining few minutes and maybe uh, give a chance to both of you uh, to answer in like one minute uh, short answers to some of these. Just take your pick which question you're interested in. They, some of them, uh, I mean, they're addressed uh, to, to both of you. Uh, one with regards to the region's heavy involvement in arms sales. How, this crisis, how is this crisis going to impact arms sales, particularly in the GCC? And uh, the, the second question is with regard to China securing its uh, oil supply from the region in light of the competition and the diminishing uh, cuts uh, and diminishing supply and so on. Are we going to see some uh, more competition, including friction in a way, tension between the superpowers to secure uh, their needs of uh, regional uh, oil uh, at, at this uh, particular time? And the third one would be with regards to the role of the sovereign wealth funds, which, uh, Garbis, you referred to, uh, to that in your uh, uh, remarks. Uh, is the importance of the role of sovereign funds going to increase uh, in this crisis, particularly in the potential uh, attempts uh, for uh, recovery? So I'll leave you with that over the next three minutes. Take your pick and uh, quick answers, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I can say a few things on the military expenditure in the region. I think uh, in the current situation, uh, given the limited fiscal space, uh, most countries in the region, whether it's Oman, Saudi Arabia, they will reduce capital expend, uh, uh, military spending. Uh, I wouldn't exclude the possibility of a peace uh, between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. That's that could happen uh, in the near future, uh, and also tensions in the Middle East uh, could be reduced. So military spending, of course, could decline, but however, from very high level. Uh, on the question of the sovereign wealth funds, uh, there is enough sovereign wealth fund, which is, I said, more than three times the size of uh, the respective economies. In Saudi Arabia, you have the public investment fund and you have the official reserves about uh, 500 billion. So that gives you around uh, 800, 900 billion dollars. In Kuwait, uh, you have 600 billion, five times the GDP in Qatar, etc. And in the UAE. So for the time being, what will happen with the sovereign wealth fund, there, they will be used more domestically to finance the large deficit instead of investing it abroad. With the uncertainty in the global economy, I think they will draw some of their sovereign wealth fund and uh, uh, spending on domestic project and uh, finance uh, the large deficit. So they can cope with, with such a situation for several years, but eventually, if oil prices uh, stay very low, they have to think of de-pegging. You know, most of the GCC countries' currencies are pegged to the dollar. Uh, so beyond the short term, I wouldn't exclude the possibility of moving to a flexible exchange rate, which will help this country to better adjust to external shocks as it happened in um, Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan. They were able to adjust to uh, lower oil prices by depreciating their currencies. Thank you. Basma, the final word is yours. So I'm going to be controversial. Uh, you know, the question about arms sales is really about, do you believe that arms are for internal or external use? Uh, 
And so the reality is that if this is for internal use, and I think a lot of countries are thinking of their arms as internal use. And if you're fearful that this is a time when you're actually going to be targeted more, uh, sometimes, I mean, think about Saudi Arabia just to pick on it because it's easy, not because it's the only country, you know, think about the fact that uh, they've seen the spread come from the Eastern provinces. Um, you know, they may see that that is a restive situation. They may need to deploy some of their internal equipment to basically preserve the peace. Um, certainly there's going to be a lot of effort to put some, uh, or to acquire technology in terms of surveillance. Absolutely. But if it's about regime perseverance, uh, or preservation, Frankly, I think we're going to see more, uh, you know, arm sales uh, go to the region, but for specific uses, which is to protect the palaces, to do street monitoring, to do the patrolling on on the ground. So I don't think we're all out of the water in terms of uh, it being uh, in decline. The sovereign wealth fund. This is really a validation of the need for sovereign wealth funds. It was really about preparing for a rainy day. Some of the wording, and I think it's Kuwait, about you know, the future generations. The big debate is going to be when is the time to use the sovereign wealth funds, as my colleague pointed out. Are they going to be saying now is the time to use the sovereign wealth funds and, and help this current generation? Or is there going to be debates in some of these countries that, you know, it's really for another 10 to 20 years down the road? I think it's going to be an important public debate in places like the Kuwaiti parliament, for example. Uh, thank you, Dr. Momini and Dr. Iradian for joining us today. Uh, appreciate your uh, time uh, and uh, appreciate your straightforward uh, answers. Uh, we leave this program uh, not necessarily with higher um, morale, but uh, definitely with more information uh, to be able to understand uh, what we are facing uh, in this crisis. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And please, uh, we look forward to seeing you again in future programs. Have a good day.